globalization countries and the immigrants? Well, that I, I don't know for sure, obviously, but the big worry in terms of the European Union is that Italy and Spain, for example, are only uh, first point of arrival and that migrants will move up to the north uh, of Europe. Uh, the truth is that in Italy, migrants do often arrive in the south and move up to the north, but they don't always go over the border into France because the north has a lot of work for migrants in Italy, especially the area around Venice or the area around Milan, the two industrial centers which offer a lot of work. And uh, how are the European countries going to deal with but uh, right now that's a, a big problem because the European Union doesn't have an agreement for all 27 countries. I mean, they have basically a pact which says that countries will respect their neighbors in terms of immigration. But there's a lot of unhappiness because there's a, there's not, they haven't reached a balance. For example, when we talk about asylum seekers, people who want to come as refugees, half of the applications go to Sweden. And Sweden is a small country, and so Sweden feels overrun by refugees, and they want countries like Italy to do more. Sweden has 30,000 people looking for refugee status every year. Italy gets seven, and Italy is a much bigger country. Yeah, interesting. Um, may Europe turn to a, into a big Lampedusa? <laughs> well, Do you think so? No, I don't think so. Lampedusa is, first of all, in a poor part of Italy. Yeah. Uh, second of all, uh, the government uh, has decided to use that as the place where they, where they will essentially create centers. It's the border area. Uh, these are very particular places. If you go and you visit them, and I have, uh, it, yes, you, you see that, that essentially you're looking at politics, uh, and you're looking at almost a, a society which very self-contained, whereas that's not the case. You know, the immigrants, when they get into Europe and other parts of Europe, they, they enter into labor markets, they find housing, and they live a more normal life than you do in Lampedusa. Okay. Um, how should our government, governments handle the immigrants come from the Arab countries? Should they say, yes, come in, we have a place for you all, no, stay in Europe? Well, you cannot open the borders to the world. That's just politically unacceptable. I mean, when I say unacceptable, I mean in terms of voters. Voters will not be like governments that just open the doors of their countries. Um, but on the other hand, the European Union is professing to support democracy. It is professing to protect human rights. And so as a result, rather than funding Tunisia in a humanitarian crisis, I think the least they could do is invite more immigrants as humanitarian refugees, and then um, provide them with the means to integrate. But that doesn't mean they have to open the doors to everybody coming from the Arab world. We're talking about those people whose lives have been disrupted and threatened specifically by the violence. But to find these people, they would need to actually have a lot of uh, work to be sure they are... Because if they start accepting more people, mm -hmm. then more people will try to come. Yes, and that is, that is the, the vicious circle. Yeah. To give an example um, from the Balkans, in 1992, when you had the record number of requests for asylum in the European Union, most were Bosnians, or some Croatians as well. And then after that, you ended up with a lot of asylum seekers who were Serbs themselves, or gypsies. And all of a sudden, the European Union didn't know how to handle these new populations because it wasn't so evident that they were under threat. And then the European Union went from one extreme reaction to another. They opened their doors, then they closed their doors. And what you have to do is you have to find a balance. And I'm not arguing that we have to open our doors to everybody. But you, you can't go from one extreme to another. You somehow have to find a balance in the middle where you're fair to those people whose lives are being threatened. But on the other hand, you, are, uh, you, know, you, you do have a process in place that people can respect for. It's very hard to do, though. It is very hard to do, exactly. Um, do we need to be afraid of religious governments, which would be against? So, I think the question would be more, do we have to be afraid of people? 
people with like Muslim people who have a religion different than ours and so on of our government, like in Germany. Right. I know, I know there are lots of debates here in France and Belgium. The whole Burka debate in France and in Belgium focus on this. I don't think we need to be afraid of anybody for any reason, not just religion. Um, but one of the, the authors who I most admire is actually a Syrian-born German here. His name is Bassam Tibi, and he wrote a book called Euro Islam. And the book is about trying to, to create a form of Islam which uh, it mirrors European values. I don't think that, that religion is a problem or culture is a problem. I think extremism is a problem. And extremism comes in all forms and it comes from all parts of the world. I'm oh, sure. <laughs> <laughs> so how long is it going to take to reach a democratic system? I don't really understand what this question is. How long is it going to take to reach a In which country? <laughs> yes, let's say in Iraq. Like, I should ask you that, you have a European Go ahead, in your mind, what do you think? I don't know, I mean, when we talk about democracy, let, let's say focus maybe on, on the relationship between Europe and North Africa. You know, really, I think that democracy will not uh, come about in terms of the relationship between the two regions until North Africa becomes more economically viable. Because this is something we see in the United States and Mexico, for example. Mexico was always considered, you know, uh, underdeveloped. Uh, and, and now that Mexico is an emerging economic power, there is more respect and there is more dialogue between the two countries. Now, of course, Mexico still has to get a lot wealthier before they will have this dialogue. And I think Europe is already opening the dialogue with North Africa, and now North African states have to have to uh, essentially bring their economic development to a point where they're, they're actually partners in this dialogue. Now I say this, we saw this with Eastern Europe. This is the new countries, the enlargement. These countries were considered second citizens of the European Union at first, but now when we talk about the Czech Republic, we'll talk about Poland, we'll talk about Hungary, we'll talk about Europe. Yes, the same, yeah. the same place. Mm -hmm. The question that is the most important question, I want to ask the question, and that is, how does Spring, how do these revolutions affect this development process? I didn't mention that in the talk. But that's going to be the big question because essentially Libya was developing. That's not completely not because you had a civil war. Tunisia, Egypt, they were becoming wealthier countries. Now the question is with these new forms of government, what's going to happen in terms of economic development? And we don't have the answer to that. So. <laughs> we'll see. <laughs> like France and Germany going to help if they do. Because France is actually so closing the border. Mm -hmm. and well, help who and what is the question? Help people, help the countries, help... That's a good question. So we would say, have, let's say have uh, the countries there, because we don't want to that. I mean, obviously, France, especially Tunisia, because of the historical relationship with Tunisia, is helping in terms of political democratization. I mean, they are uh, in, in, in Tunisia supporting the new government uh, there. They have been politically supportive of that government from the beginning. I think they were, Sarkozy was quite surprised by this revolution in Tunisia. And that was a quite embarrassing for him. Some of the questions he got where they asked, why didn't you expect this? Why didn't you see it coming? And you know, he didn't have an answer. But once it did happen, he has been present. Germany, Germany's role in that region is a little less pronounced than France's or Italy's because Germany is not a military country, and geographically as well. It's not considered a sphere of interest. But on the other hand, what Germany is helping is through the European Union, through multilateral relations with this region. And so, for example, a lot of the money being sent now to Tunisia to help um, deal with this, this flow of, of Libyan refugees, but that's also coming from Germany. So it's one of the countries that's helping. It means that um, the Tunisians have discovered that uh, the Benani and Sarkozy were big fans. I don't want to say big fans, but they have... They have a relationship. Yes. yes. <laughs> and because uh, this means that the Tunisian will not have any confidence in France because 
Yes, and with uh, the story with Michel and Marie and so yeah. Now this, this is going to be a, a, a challenge, let's put it that way, for France to recover the relationship. I mean, Ben Ali had the full support, not just of France, but of the West in general. And so now what the France has to do is start a new relationship and the challenge is to build bridges between France and Tunisia um, once again. But Sarkozy is, is very aware of that and he's trying to do it. Uh, yes, it will take time anyway. But you could say the same about Italy because Italy, for example, is so much behind Gaddafi that if Gaddafi ever loses power, uh, Italy will be in very big trouble in Libya. Honestly? But Gaddafi was uh, ostracized in internationally. No more running relationships with Libya. And then in 2004, under Italian pressure, he passed a new immigration law saying that Libya will now help stop immigration to get Libya immigration. And a year later, Berlusconi was the one who went to the European Union and also to the United Nations, lobbying for Libya to be reintegrated into the diplomatic community. And so as a result, the relationship between Gaddafi and Libya is very, very close, as a matter of fact. And if, if he loses power, Italy is going to have a lot of difficulty in Libya. And that's not even mentioned in the time of colonialism, because that used to be in the time of economy, so there are lots of memories as well. So yes, Europe and North Africa um, right now we're in the process of renegotiation. That's a, to me, as a political scientist, that's a good thing. I think that instability every once in a while is not bad as long as it's it's done in a way where you don't have the kind of civil war like you do in India today and the people shouldn't have to suffer. But the fact that France now has to renegotiate its relationship with Tunisia, I don't consider that a bad thing. I think that's fair, actually. <laughs>
big question is because uh, I think refugees comes to uh, a lot of immigrants comes to uh, the Europe because they don't have
that on YouTube, but I think they may have that in they have an ethic here too, right. but it's only for German and they can uh, choose between religion and ethics. So. That's what we have in Luxembourg as yeah, well. Yeah, for French students, which is more philosophy. Oh, okay. um, yeah, it's really different. Um, what are the visible the positive consequences in the countries that we cannot really see right now? Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. 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 Thank you.